Thank you everyone for joining us today for Data Theorem's webinar series. Today's topic is the top six security needs for APIs and serverless apps, securing APIs across Amazon Lambda, Google Cloud Functions, and Azure Functions. A little bit about Data Theorem. We were founded in 2013 in the heart of Silicon Valley, and our leadership has over 15 years of security industry experience. We've been fortunate enough to help a number of great customers with their security needs over that period of time. Before I turn it over to Doug, who will be our speaker today, I just wanna let everybody know that you can ask your questions in the Q&A panel, and we will try our best to answer them throughout the presentation or when we have reserved some time at the end. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Doug Dooley, COO of Data Theorem. All right, thanks, Richard. Um, Okay, everybody, we're going to try to cover these topics today. Um, so here are the, the five major topics. We're going to talk about modern apps. What are the characteristics and adoption trends around uh, modern applications? What are some of the five big security problems that modern apps pose? And when you look at tools, a variety of security tools that exist, what are some of the limitations when using third-party API gateways in the sort of the modern era? Um, and then we'll look at six API security needs. And then we'll close with a recap and some recommendations on how to move forward. So modern applications, what are the new trends, some of the best practices, and also some of the statistics that we're seeing around these kind of new applications? Um, so uh, the first is a growing trend to really around speed. Every company um, is essentially becoming a software company, even industries that were traditionally um, not as sort of high tech centric have figured out that their data and the insights they have about their business are better utilized when leveraging software and that the rate that software is changing now in production is very different than it was 10 years ago and and dramatic, you know, even different than what just say five years ago. And so the acceleration and the le the use of automation has allowed the processes of agile and DevOps to change production software much more easily, but many of the security models that have existed in the past can't keep up with sort of this new world of uh, high automation. Sorry, transitioning slides here. Okay, so with modern applications, how do we define modern application? What are the characteristics? So one, it starts really with APIs at sort of the center. Um, the, the world has moved to more reusable, smaller components of software that you could describe as a microservice. And that microservice connects with other uh, pieces of software or microservices, typically through a fabric of APIs. Um, and so lots of data transfers either through these private APIs or even public facing APIs. Mobile applications are another area of modern uh, apps, um, heavily on iOS and Android, but it's the easiest way to get a rich application experience to a human because we all as people are carrying around these supercomputers on our hands uh, that are constantly connected to the network. And so because of that, there was a time where mobile was not viewed as a first class app um, for businesses. Now I think that's, that switch has definitely occurred where mobile is the most frequent usage of, of an application. Um, software development kits uh, are another another area where making reusability and making developers' lives much easier to create applications has really changed, both in the proprietary format of SDKs, but also open source. Uh, SPAs, you know, again, this is just a class of web application, but using frameworks like JavaScript React has really sort of changed um, the state of the client through a browser on a web application, and really a lot of the uh, logic and the processing is happening on the back end API, and there's just sort of a rendering display issue uh, when you use something like a, a single page app. Uh, and then the last is really around delivery. So the combination of CI and CD tools, uh, continuous integration, continuous development, allows customers to update software much faster than before, sometimes hourly, definitely daily and weekly updates are, are, are happening in production using things like CI, CD. Um, the other issue is really around this curated process of using an app store, uh, Apple and Google being the two largest for mobile, but the ability to publish an application and push out an update quickly and automatically has really changed how modern applications um, work and, and, and how do you keep them secure. And then the last that we're going to dig into a little bit more is really around serverless application frameworks. And 
serverless to to me is really an evolution of what we've been doing from virtualization to containerization to orchestration serverless is sort of the latest iteration of that and it, but it is different and it's important to understand that difference because it has an impact on security so what is serverless serverless computing is really a, an execution model that helps developers and companies be able to orchestrate the necessary infrastructure at the time of, of runtime. Um, so one of the concepts is really function as a service and the companies that have really popularized function as a service at scale are first, firstly Amazon. Amazon introduced Lambda about four years ago and its growth and adoption has been pretty remarkable. Uh, Google and Microsoft also have um, equivalent offerings, maybe not quite at the, late of, uh, the state of maturity as Lambda, um, but in many ways, they've done things that have made it even easier. So, uh, so those these are the three most popular uh, serverless application frameworks. But there are others besides these three. But ultimately, it's really about making the developer's life much easier and not having to leverage um, sort of DevOps skills for the infrastructure layer. And so, then when we look at uh, an interesting st statistic around adoption. So when most people think about modern software, they think about using containers for, again, to make the developer's life much easier, but also to have reusability across multiple clouds, uh, develop on-prem, develop on a laptop, et cetera. So containers for sure in the last 10 years, particularly on Linux, has grown quite a bit of an adoption. And so if you just look uh, a year-over-year -year growth of Docker in AWS, it continues to grow at a pretty fast pace. Um, yet, if you look at something like Lambda, which will, you know, underneath is leveraging things like containers and, and Kubernetes, um, you're seeing an incredible amount of growth, twice as fast from an adoption perspective um, that we've seen with software and containers. And so, again, this is a unique change, and it's it's an important statistic to look at when it comes to adoption. Doug, we have a, a question here on this topic. Sure. Uh, the question that's in the audience is, what if we only have containers but no serverless apps? Does this apply? Yeah, I think, um, so that's a question we've seen before, you know, talking about containers versus serverless. Look, I don't think, um, yeah, obviously containers, lots of infrastructure and security people understand uh, what containers are and they can and they can easily see how, what their container environment looks like. Uh, serverless is a little bit more tricky. Oftentimes we'll hear security or IT tell us, well, our developers aren't really using serverless or we don't have any serverless in our environment. And when we use our discovery service, we go and find all kinds of serverless uh, uh, apps in their environment. And so they're always sort of shocked because they didn't know what they didn't know when it came to serverless. And so the point here is that if this level of adoption is occurring, you almost have comparable levels of adoption on Lambda versus Docker just in AWS. Um, there's probably more serverless than most people realize is happening in their environment. And so that's kind of the concept of like when a serverless app has an API, you sort of have a shadow API moment. It doesn't necessarily mean there's it's bad. It just means you just weren't aware that this was happening. Um, and so whether you're using containers natively or you're using containers through serverless, I think what we're talking about here still applies. That was a great question though. So why are apps even going serverless? I think there's two major characteristics. One is lower cost. You're never paying for idle time. Um, you know, Amazon makes it very clear. They charge when the app is running and they're doing it in 100 millisecond increments of charging. And so it's a very low cost model to build an app to never really have to pay for the underlying infrastructure, particularly when that app is not popular or that app is running idle. The other part is really what folks are starting to realize when an application gets popular and starts to scale, you're tending to bring in these DevOps architects to help you think through all your capacity planning, all your performance monitoring. There's a lot of work that really needs to go to as you hit global scale of an application. And so that drives a higher cost and it drives a, a certain level of complexity to figure out how to use Kubernetes correctly and how to spin up and spin down different kinds of containers. If you listen to Amazon's architect, this is a slide from Amazon themselves. When Amazon is recommending customers building a new application like mobile or IoT, they're saying start with Lambda first and then only back out of Lambda if for some reason the application can't run on Lambda. 
Um, and then you can use something like EC2 or containers. And so that's an interesting shift in Amazon's approach around helping developers build applications is to really focus on, on doing that first. But the implication is the moment a developer designs an app with serverless, the infrastructure becomes ephemeral to them or ephemeral to the business. The API is still exposed, um, but the underlying infrastructure to be able to hook changes. And so this has a, a deeper implication to security teams and IT teams when this shift occurs. So let's talk about some of the big security problems that modern applications and these kind of newer frameworks do introduce. So number one is, we talked about this earlier, uh, is the pace of change. DevOps teams have become incredibly powerful in an organization because if you're driving new software or, or you want the software teams to move and change at the rate of business decisions, the DevOps teams are one of the best groups to work with in order to have those changes push out into the public environment uh, quickly. However, many of the security teams have not grown up uh, embracing automation by default, where a DevOps team does automation. They're, they have no other way to survive without doing automation with this level of, of change. And so that's a really unique problem of DevOps's default approach versus historical securities approach with using automation in order to drive speed. Another big problem is really around the growth of APIs. So uh, software development kits is by far the number one reason why API growth is happening on the back end, but you're also seeing mobile applications drive the consumption and the creation of new APIs. And then there's sort of a growing, uh, albeit smaller fuel of API growth really coming from newer IoT applications. But in all these situations, you know, APIs, on the back end don't appear to be slowing down you know more and more microservices more apis connecting microservices together continue to drive this so what are the top three challenges that enterprise customers are saying they're having with their api strategy or using apis so gartner went out and surveyed a bunch of their customers and this is what they came back with the number one concern with an api strategy of an enterprise customer is security uh, who has access to the data that the api is providing who uh, uh, how is things being encrypted correctly etc so there's a variety of security concerns with apis also the lack of skills particularly as you move into modern apis is a challenge for a lot of businesses and standardization. Um, we'll talk a little, Gardner actually does a pretty good job of explaining how you should think through building an API, how do you architect it and how you make it easier to consume um, for usage. And you know things like Swagger and OpenAPI 3.0 are driving more standardization um, into, uh, into APIs. But again, this is a big challenge that almost every enterprise customer is dealing with with their APIs. Now, the other unfortunate piece of, of what APIs do, on one hand, they enable the business to create new uh, ways to interact with their customers and business partners, create no, more ways to monetize their data. But unfortunately, the hackers can also monetize a customer's data by, by these data breaches. And so more and more data breaches have been popping up over the last 12 to 18 months. This, this is just in the last 12 months, some very large name customers have been in the headlines uh, for data loss, and this is unfortunate. We never want to see this happen to our customers. We you know we care deeply about protecting them from from these kinds of headlines, but ultimately the APIs are being pointed to as the main culprit to how the data extraction and the data exfiltration occurred. And so, again, I unfortunately I don't think these headlines are going away over the next few years. Um, they, they, it may even increase just because of the rate of the number of APIs that are growing in people's environments. So the last major problem that we're going to talk about with um, with uh, modern apps is really around uh, the security tools. So if you have a bunch of existing security tools that you used to count on, um, when you move into a modern app environment, it's hard to enforce these things where you know you have to have access to the server or the container, or you have to have access to a firewall or proxy, or you you know the the developer has to use an API gateway. There's really no consistent way to enforce this on developers as they're building modern applications. And in some situations with modern applications, all of this is sort of hidden to the development team and to the app designers. And so when that happens, sort of retrofitting these kind of old constructs into the new world um, makes it very difficult. And then it has an implication on what kind of security tools will actually be effective uh, with these types of applications. 
So now we're going to transition to uh, some of the limitations of API gateways. And, um, and, and again, these limitations show up when you have a different, more modern architecture. So if you look at the current state of, let's call it API security tools, particularly API gateways, um, one of the biggest issues is where was this technology developed and for what purpose? So if you built an application in your private on-premise data center and you were using an egress point or a network essentially choke point to have that API publish out onto the internet, you had a natural place for an API gateway to live. And that was essentially at the ingress egress point of your network. Um, so as data flowed out, you had a place that a gateway made a lot of sense. Um, however, when you take that model and move it into the more modern era of cloud microservices, you start to see that there's a challenge. Again, so on the left-hand side, let's call that a traditional environment. You have a LAN, you have a WAN internet, and then you have a DMZ in the middle. It makes a lot of sense to put an API gateway um, to provide protection of your APIs. However, the moment you move into a cloud microservices environment where you have the, all these tiny little microservices and they're all glued together through APIs and then you're connecting to other applications and partner applications and et cetera, you start to see that the number of network choke points increases to a place where the level of complexity is non-trivial. And so our customers have already told us this is a tough model for them to get excited about for the future of modern software. And so they're looking for new ways to solve these problems versus just taking a hammer and trying to kind of whack all the nails. And so this is, again, just a point of view uh, of like what our customers have been telling us is a, is a big challenge by depending only on API gateways. Doug, we actually have a question right here. Okay. Uh, the question is, we use API gateways. Do you think API gateways are going away with the advent of microservices? Um, look, I don't think API gateways are going away anytime soon. You know, the the thing about IT, many old tools don't go away. Um, you know, they, they stick around for a long time because they have some sort of purpose. And if, if as long as they're functional, you know, uh, it's kind of like if it's not, if it's not broke, why fix it? And so, uh, but the issue is, will the same level of growth of API gateways that worked on on-premise also work in the cloud? Uh, and that's when I don't know. I don't know the answer. I, I don't have a crystal ball on what's going to happen to API gateways. All I know is when things are really complex, uh, customers tend to look for simpler, easier solutions. And this this thing on the right looks very complex to us. And when we talk to our development teams uh, for our own software uh, built in Google Cloud and built in Amazon, um, they're not excited about doing things like this. And so the, I think time will tell what will be the future of traditional API or third-party API gateways. But look, native API gateways like the Amazon's native API gateway or, or um, Azure's native API gateway, we think those will be fine. Uh, they'll be leveraged when necessary. Um, and our our view is that customers need additional security tools and technologies besides just leveraging what they had in the past. So that's a great question, though. And no, I do not think API gateways are uh, g going away just because microservices exist. So... Um, so let's look, let's talk about some of the six API security needs that really apply to modern, uh, both mobile and and serverless applications. So the first is really around this concept of discovery, um, having a fully automated, continuous way to discover APIs and applications that are in your environment is really important. Um, we often uh, talk to customers, and there's a lot of fear of we don't know what we don't know because. Our development teams, this has been one of the best times ever to be a developer to build an application, but uh, IT and security often don't even know a new application has been built, a new a API has been published, it's on the internet, sometimes it's um, you know, not f really fitting into the security model. So discovery is one of the most important pieces of sort of a new way to deal with um, sort of modern apps. The second is really around um, standardization. You know, we saw when Gartner surveyed a bunch of enterprise customers, uh, I think it was number th three in their top three of 
problems that enterprises are dealing with is the lack of standardization. So if, well, if I go to an IT or security team right now and say, could you give me the list of all your APIs? Um, they, they were like, well, I, I, we need to do a discovery process and, and or here's what we do know. And then uh, could you give us a specification list of all of everything those APIs are supposed to do? And this is where typically IT and security don't have that visibility of like what is even going on, what is supposed to be happening with their APIs. And so sometimes you turn to the gateway to give you some of those answers. Uh, but when an API is bypassing the gateway, then what do you do? And so again, when you're being audited through an external party or you're doing your own internal audit, being able to automatically generate at any point in time your current specifications of what your APIs are supposed to do, this is a very crucial step that needs to happen for, for, for modern app security. Number three is really around, um, I would argue is the number one way uh, data breaches occur on APIs. Generally, an attacker or hacker has figured out a way to compromise the authentication layer um, you know, by either interpreting or, or you, know, you know, using some sort of a token or key that they shouldn't have access to in order to um, compromise the authentication or encryption. You know, you're using some very old version of SSL or, or TLS 1.0 that's not compliant. You know, there's, there's some mechanism to do a man in the middle attack. I mean, there's different techniques in order to uh, compromise this layer, but this is a very important layer that I would argue is still the number one way an API gets compromised versus some super sophisticated zero day attack. It, it's usually something much more simple, right? A developer accidentally turned off authentication. Um, They're doing some troubleshooting. The attacker took advantage of the authentication being disabled temporarily and, and, um, and data breaches occur. And I would say the number two reason, uh, which brings us to who's consuming your API. So on the client side, whether it's mobile applications or web applications, the consumptions of that API is where the data is exfiltrating to. Um, being able to quickly figure out who are the largest consumers of those APIs, are you seeing any weird behavior and who's consuming those APIs? Being able to audit that quickly um, is something that customers are, are really struggling to figure out how to do um, at scale. All right, so here we go. Number five. Um, Doug, before we yeah. move to number five, there was a question on number four. Okay. Uh, can you give examples of tools that list out all the clients for a given API? Uh, yeah, so I think there are, you know, obviously I think a lot of DevOps teams write um, different utilities and leverage some open source to kind of try to figure out, you know, all the different connections to their API uh, gateways or an API. Um, um, or APIs in general, at least the ones they, that they publish. Um, you know, one thing I can say is like, at least Data Theorem has a, a product called AppSecure where we our analyzer engine will often, because it's a binary runtime uh, analyzer that will take an app and, and sort of uh, see it dynamically running and then enumerate all the APIs that a mobile app will connect to. And so, and typically on average, Every mobile app that we've seen, and we've seen, you know, uh, you know, there's five million apps in the app stores, and we can look at all of them. Um, Ten to fifteen API calls are being made on a mobile application on average, and we notice, you know, our, you know, at least our customers are, are telling us they recognize maybe a third to a half of those APIs, um, but oftentimes there'll be a, you know, another half to a third that they weren't aware of. Uh, they didn't even know that these mobile apps were connected to these. Um, to these either third-party APIs or APIs that the development team had created, um, but it was never told or notified to security or the IT team. So this is, again, is one of those issues where it's never been a better time to be an app developer, building mobile, building APIs, but uh, very challenging from a security IT perspective to, to uh, get visibility into that area. So that's a great question. And yeah, there are some tools that will help you be able to identify the biggest consumers of, of your APIs. So this one with regards to data access and source uh, source code. So look, I think um, if you look at a, a early indicator of where an API is um, going to be created or built, you can often look at source code, you know, things like GitHub being connected into your CI CD environment. You can do some source code analysis as part of your um, lifecycle auditing and security assessments. And from that, it can sort of inform you of new APIs that are being created um, from source. But the other piece of this is really around 
when an app has access to a data, the class of data that it has access to can change the impact of whether you've been breached. So if you have a brand new mobile application, it's using 10 to 15 different APIs. Those 10 to 15 different APIs have access to you know, dozens of other data sources. One of those data sources could contain very sensitive information. And at that point, you can see that the impact of the breach, you know, it's a it's a reverse engineer or break of a mobile API, uh, mobile app to break into the API. Um, you can see where this huge impact has happened. And and again, with some of those headlines, literally that's what's happened in those situations is, you know, there were backend APIs that they didn't realize had access to certain kinds of data and as a result had a, a much higher impact than they thought could occur. And now here on the last one, it's really about the digital exhaust and the application footprint that um, customers have with their with their application. So, you know, can you parse and analyze your logs? Can you create alerts and events for errors? You know, an example, uh, you know, giving credit to Amazon, um, they use something called, or they have, they offer something called CloudWatch, and CloudWatch can look at the logs that are generated on your APIs into CloudTrail, and they can, uh, you know, create threshold events for resource consum consumption. So, you know, if anybody's familiar with DOS, uh, denial of service attack, well, if you try to DOS a serverless app, what happens on that serverless app is, you know, underneath really there's a Kubernetes orchestration kind of layer that's continuing to spin up compute network storage resources in order to handle the DOS attack, right? Because you could just be a very popular application at that moment. And so as you're handling that DOS attack, you're consuming a massive amount of resources. And so I think Microsoft probably deserves credit for this, but I think they called it a denial of wallet attack. So by doing a denial of wallet, you're really doing sort of a, economic attack uh, by consuming massive amount of resources and driving up your bills on applications. And so this is an example where if you have alerts and thresholds, you can kind of protect yourself from that type of uh, security attack in a modern application that's using serverless. Uh, and again, all of these things, you want them to be continuous. You want them to be highly automated. It's going to be monitoring and alerting all the time across um, across your clouds and, and to some extent, uh, even into your on-premise um, APIs. So, all right. So, all right. So we're going to now wrap it up, uh, talk about some of the use cases that we recommend focusing on, um, and then give you a few do's and don'ts. And, um, and then we'll do a recap of, of kind of what we, we've covered. So use cases to solve first, uh, you know, for us, because mobile and SDKs drive a bulk of some of the new software that's being built and 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 backend APIs that are being created, mobile is a natural place to start. You know, can you dig in more to figure out what's really happening with your mobile applications and all the new APIs that are being consumed or uh, connected to? And and we often will help our customers find APIs they never knew existed um, because the the mobile app team wasn't fully connected to the rest of the development team. Um, or the DevOps team, and and again, that that to us is a moment where we're calling it a shadow API. And in the case of a shadow API, it doesn't necessarily mean that the API is bad or good. It just hasn't been vetted yet, right? It hasn't gone through any kind of security security assessment process. And so this API now lives either in a pr private or public way, but it's accessible, um, and software can access it, and therefore it becomes a potential threat vector for the business if, if, if data is extracted out of that, uh, you know, in a way that wasn't intended. Um, so again, so chat, so being able to quickly discover and continuously discover APIs that you didn't know existed, particularly in the public cloud, um, that's a crucial one for uh, modern application security. The second is, a, is this cross-check idea. So let's say I have a traditional API gateway, whether it's Amazon, Microsoft, or Google's native API gateway, or it's a third party API gateway. If your strategy has been all of my APIs should go through my gateway, what if we discover, or what if some you discover a new API that's been created that's bypassing the gateway? And so many of the common practices around authentication and encryption and logging, um, they it might still be happening, uh, but you don't know for sure, especially if your strategy has been historically to drive all of your APIs through this kind of network choke point called an API gateway. Um, and then the last is really around serverless. Again, we showed this statistic that frankly was shocking to me. Um, 
we know Docker is very popular. It is a very popular way to build new software, but the rate of growth of serverless is is surpassing. Uh, you know, I feel confident over the next year or two, uh, there will be far more applications using serverless than even using Docker or using a container. And so therefore, um, this is an, in, in, a place where if you're counting on the underlying infrastructure to inform you of new APIs and, and new applications, um, you're sort of flying blind if you don't really have an approach to deal with serverless applications. All right, so these are those are the four main use cases that we think um, folks should focus on early on with their modern application security practice. So thinking about modern AppSec, here's our list of do's and don'ts. Um, you know, again, we have a point of view. We, we don't know for 100%, right? But again, talking to our customers and um, you know, going out trying to solve these kinds of problems, these are the things that for us make sense and maybe don't make as much sense. So on the do's, um, API access and being able to get a standardized spec is really important and keeping that spec up to date and continuously accessing the API is really crucial. Um, within your CI CD environment, as things change quickly, being able to have some level of code access, particularly for API discovery is, is important. Um, there will always be some, some level of static code analysis, but I don't think that's the especially for things like mobile static code analysis uh, you know not not quite the benefit that you ultimately want but being able to be informed of what's changing that that's where the benefits come from um again we talked about the number one area where apis are typically getting compromised it, it, it tends to stand right here in this authentication and encryption layer if you know the users that you don't expect are accessing uh, or, or, or clients are accessing the API that you don't expect, um, that this is a big problem. Uh, we talked about the digital exhaust of logs for errors and alerts and creating thresholds and creating monitoring alerts. The, this, is, this is another very crucial area for, for, for modern applications. And if and when possible, using a service that can come in sort of as a, as a third party read only um, to see your entire public cloud environment, this is proven to be a very useful technique, particularly around discovery. Um, and again, not everybody is comfortable with giving uh, a read-only access role um, to be able to do discovery, but the customers who've been doing this have been getting an incredible return on investment by you know, either writing a script or using a service that does this for them. And then the last is, uh, if you can, um, you know, example would be Lambda. If you build a Lambda app on Amazon, you know, my, Am Amazon is encouraging customers to go through Amazon's API gateway. Now, there's cost implications. You know, I've heard the saying that if you build a serverless app on Lambda, it's only pennies of cost for the serverless part, but it's dollars of cost for the API gateway part because you get charged for throughput on the gateway. So, um, but anyways, the point is, if you have this kind of choke point, you can sort of standardize around auth and encryption and logging, um, and, the, and the gateway can provide some of that benefit. And again, a cloud native one for a cloud native app makes makes a bunch of sense. Now, on the the don'ts, here is where if you've been in the security industry for ten or fifteen years, you'll know like these are sort of best practices in traditional security uh, because you either use a network choke point or you used um, some mechanism to install an agent on an operating system or, or some sort of operating system uh, layer like a container. And so whenever you're dependent on having direct access to Linux or Windows or, or a virtual container and you want to install a server-side or client-side agent, we think all of this is very tricky and difficult and potentially prone to failure in a modern AppSec practice. Also, these choke points, we talked about it. When you move to a microservices cloud architecture, there are just so many choke points that you have to go after. So trying to stick firewalls and proxies and gateways at all the different choke points adds a level of complexity um, and, again, has a high uh, probability of, of error and, and not being able to do proper coverage. So this is, a, this is a place where, again, we don't think any of this is going away here on the right-hand side, particularly in on-premise traditional environments, but in the modern era, these become much harder to do at scale. So what, what is our answer? Our answer is really you know, moving to an automated analyzer engine, whether the one, it's one that you can build yourself, uh, try to leverage some open source, or, or you know, if, if you can find someone who does it, then great. And it, ultimately, the engines 
goal is to discover and conduct continuous assessments and taking advantage of the things that are available in modern apps, which are APIs, source code, the auth layer, the encryption layer, and again, that digital exhaust that comes off of the variety of logs that happen. And again, you know, not to be like shamelessly plugging, but we do have products in this area. We have a brand new API discover product and an API inspect product. We encourage you to check out a demo if you're interested in, in giving it a, it a run yourself. You know, just log in and sign up for a demo uh, on our website. So the summary and recap here is really around, you know, we covered what are the characteristics of modern applications? Um, what are the, some of the big problems that we see that uh, modern applications introduce on security? And then what are the real needs that API security needs that have that um, impact on modern applications? And then again, our point of view, the answer is you have to move to something that's a continuous automated engine that's constantly doing discovery of your apps, discovery of your APIs, and continuously doing security assessments because in modern software, um, the software changes a lot in production. So that's it. And uh, I guess, Richard, if you want to have folks uh, go over any questions, we can we can do that. Yeah, yeah thank you, Doug. Uh, at this point, we actually don't have any other additional questions. Um, so what I'll go ahead and do is we'll, we'll go ahead and wrap. Uh, we have recorded today's session. We will make it available to everyone after the fact.